Ephesians verses 7 to 14. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that he who were the first hope in Christ might uh, be to uh, the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of, the, of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and belie uh, believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Amen. Uh, we will uh, look at this video, one-minute video, uh, and uh, we'll uh, get to the text. We have one more It's gift. not the way I mean, but it's, yeah, it's um, another gift. Why don't you careful open it up. There we go. I want you to read it. I'm going to be adopted? We love you, sweetheart. We'll always be your parents. I love you so much. I love you. We love you, sweetheart. We'll always be your parents. Okay? You're a real family. You get to take care of you. How touching it is that when she finds out that she is adopted, wow. Uh, the reason why we show this video is uh, a few verses before this text in verse 5, that's the underlying foundation and sentiment of uh, this passage, that we are children of God who are adopted in Jesus Christ. We are children of God, but we are all adopted children of God in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only unique uh, son of God in Jesus Christ. And so when we are in Jesus Christ, because of Jesus Christ, we are adopted children of God. We do receive all the same benefits of a child of God or children of God, but that is all in Jesus Christ, adopted children of God. That's the underlying basis of all the benefit that we receive in Jesus Christ in this passage. So uh, that's a kind of uh, probably a appreciation that we should have thankfulness and awe that we should have that we are adopted children of God. We are children of God in Jesus Christ. So uh, we're, we're on chapter 1. Chapter 1 is about that, that we are adopted children of God. We are saved in Jesus Christ and especially salvation from God's point of view. That's chapter 1 theological point of view. And chapter 2, we're going to get to chapter 2, that's more, more so salvation from our point of view, more psychological point of view or spiritual point of view. Uh, often, if we just look at, oh, I'm saved, I accepted Jesus Christ, when we understand and see ourselves from our perspective, we have a shallow view of our salvation, shallow view of Christian life. We should also have, a, have God's perspective. God has different perspective but because he sees a lot higher than us, a lot longer than us, a lot deeper than us. So chapter 1 is talk about, talking about his perspective. Just as when we don't understand other people, we misunderstand each other. You know, I do a lot of marriage counseling, and that's the problem of, you know, married people. They don't understand each other. They can't see each other's perspective, and they interpret what the other person is doing from their own perspective. That's a problem. And sometimes we are like that with God. We don't understand God's perspective. So, you know, even though we cannot completely understand in his omniscient view, uh, you know, eternal view, 
uh, still we need to try. And chapter 1 is talking about salvation from God's perspective so that we also can have salvation from our perspective and more have a comprehensive perspective. Therefore, hopefully we'll have a deeper appreciation for salvation in Jesus Christ. So chapter 1 is going to talk about his sovereignty, how sovereignly he elects us, saves us, and all these things. We talked about that last week. Uh, and that's not in negation of our responsibility. That doesn't mean we have freedom just because God is sovereign. You know, God uh, works not in spite of our choices. Uh, of course, things happen not only because of our choices, but, also, but we know that God works uh, through our choices. Even though our choices are real in such a way, we are responsible for our choices. But in the midst of all that, that God does his thing. And we don't exactly know what that means, right? But we know that God is sovereignly working through our choices uh, so that uh, he will be honored and glorified. And whole history is headed that way. Uh, In the original Greek, this uh, chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, these 12 verses are one sentence. Basically, Paul is getting excited as he's thinking about salvation from God's perspective. Uh, three main things that he talks about, how God the Father blesses us in Jesus Christ, talking about his Son and the Holy Spirit, Trinitarian blessing and praise. Uh, so this uh, 12 verses are continual, single, complex, sort of run-on sentence because he can't stop. He's just so excited. He's just praising God. Uh, This is a dramatic song which extends to the end of verse 14, one long rhapsodic sentence. He's singing, praising. And hopefully uh, as we finish today, that will be the response of our hearts. Last week we talked about the blessings that comes from God. Today, Blessing that comes through Jesus Christ, the Son, as, as well as the Holy Spirit, will mainly talk about that. Uh, so uh, let's get to the text. As we look into the text, uh, first point is through verse 7 and 8. Because of Jesus, secondly, we receive blessings, mainly two blessings that we're going to talk about, uh, through the Holy Spirit. Three perspective of how Holy Spirit blesses us. So we'll talk about this. Because of Jesus Christ, we uh, receive blessings uh, through the Holy Spirit. All right. So first of all, first point, because of Jesus, verses 7 and then 8. The verse 7 starts with this little phrase, in him, in Jesus Christ. That's a very important phrase in the Bible, very important phrase uh, to Paul's letters, especially in Ephesians. In Christ, in Jesus, in Him. Uh, These are many times mentioned in these 14 verses up to now uh, in Ephesians 1. Whether it's in Christ, in Him, occurs about 11 times, maybe more. So formerly, Before we came to know Christ, we were believers. We were in Adam. We were in union with Adam, belonging to the old fallen humanity. But now we are in Jesus Christ. This is God's perspective. We are in Jesus Christ, belonging to a new redeemed humanity, new redeemed community. Uh, So Paul is explaining the process of adoption mentioned in verse 5. Uh, And he's showing the perspective of God. When God sees us, even though we are sinful, we still fall, God sees us in Jesus Christ. And this it's this phrase called union with Christ. It's a theological phrase called union with Christ. We are in union with Christ. That's how God sees us. He sees us and Jesus Christ as one. It means two things we'll talk about here. Uh, we are in Christ. Union with Christ means we are in Christ. And secondly, it means Christ is also in us. We are in Christ. That means all that is bad in us, Jesus takes away. There's exchange taking place when we are in Jesus Christ, but it's not just uh, normal exchange, but this exchange somehow makes, uh, as Jesus comes into us, he cleanses all of our Bad things, sins, all that is bad in us. 
Just like when you put chlorine in the pool, in the water, it doesn't just mix. No, chlorine kills uh, many things that are bad in the water. Just like that when we are one in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ comes into us and it uh, destroys all that is bad, sinful in us. That's what it means, one, one aspect of what it means. But also, it also means Christ is in us. That means also all that is good of Christ, Jesus gives to us because we are in union with Christ. All that is good. It's similar to marriage. You know, when you get married, unless there's prenuptial agreement or something like that, if there's a marriage, if you marry a rich guy, if you're female, you marry a rich guy, I hope you, that's not the reason why you got married, but if you marry a rich guy, or uh, if uh, you marry a rich lady, right, you kind of, everything of yours, everything of theirs becomes, uh, you know, you're, you're together. You're one, there, but whatever you possess is whatever you possess together. Uh, it's the same as the marriage of the people of God to the person of God. We, you know, in Christ, everything that is His is ours in Jesus Christ. That's what union of Christ, union with Christ means. Now, next two sub points are in detailed explanation of those two things how He takes all the bad things away and how He gives us all that is righteous and good into us. So, Next, next thing is what does, specifically what does God take away from us? Verse 7, it says, in him, in union with Christ, it says we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of the trespasses according to the riches of his grace. The word redemption means delivery by payment of price. Redemption is talking about we're in slavery. And uh, interestingly, we, we, we are talking about for missions, uh, prayer that we are talking about slavery all over the world. And uh, those, that kind of slavery is so tragic and uh, dangerous and sinful and deep, yet that's still shallow in comparison to our slavery in our heart, slavery of sin. Those things are still temporary slavery, but there is eternal slavery that we are enslaved to sin. And that, that's what he's talking about. Jesus Christ takes our eternal uh, spiritual slavery away through redemption, deliverance by payment of, of price. And payment was the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, it wasn't million dollars. It wasn't billion dollars. It was precious blood. And the blood of Jesus Christ is of infinite value by his blood because of the person of Jesus Christ is person of infinite value. And that's why one person's blood, Jesus Christ, can cleanse all of our sins because value of Jesus Christ, who is God, man, is infinite. Therefore, his blood, by his blood, he can forgive us. That was the payment of our price so that we can be free. This redemption makes adoption possible, giving us a filial relationship to God our Father through Jesus Christ. That means we're in bondage. That means we need the blood of the Son of God. That it talks about how powerful sin is. You can't just get rid of it. It takes the death and the blood of the Son of God for our, clean, our sins to be cleansed. Death of Jesus Christ bleeding means that we deserve capital punishment, that we deserve eternal punishment, eternal death, uh, eternal suffering uh, apart from Christ, but it took, that's why it took the blood of Jesus Christ for him to cleanse us. You know, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, one of the last things he said was, it is finished. The last words of Jesus should be the first word of Christian life. Because he finished, we can start, we can begin to receive the blessings of God in Jesus Christ. Uh, being in Christ means not only he takes away bad, but he also gives us what is good, infinitely good, eternally good. That's what and the verse 7 and 8 is talking about also here. It says, to the riches of his grace. It says, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. That's why we got the title, Crazy Rich Christian, if you see them, Crazy Rich Asian. But, you know, we borrow that and Crazy, crazy Rich Christians. Wonderful movie, by the way, if you... Didn't see it yet. Go see with your grandma and 
uh, and uh, we did that too. But, you know, we are, uh, verse 7, to the riches of his grace. This is what we have in Jesus Christ. Infinite riches in Jesus Christ. Verse 8, which he lavished upon us. And notice that according to that richness of Jesus Christ, the richness of God, it says the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. That means how many times do I have to say this? We fall, we fail, but we can go to him. You know what's coming, right? Again and again and again and again and again. I know some of you are tired of that, but... I need it every day, so I'm not tired of it. I'm never going to be tired of it. Uh, we can go to him again and again and again. His blood never runs out, and uh, he will always forgive us. Our forgiveness according to the riches of his grace. How much grace. I love that uh, song in Amazing Grace. The fourth verse, verse it says, When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as sun, we have less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. His grace will never run out. We can go to him again and again and again. And whenever we fail, he's going to forgive us. That means you cannot sin more than God can forgive. You can never sin more than God can forgive. You can go to him again. There's always more forgiveness in Jesus Christ because this forgiveness is according to uh, to the riches of his grace. You can always be forgiven. Always keep going. Uh, he gives us carefully planned. He gives us wisdom. He gives us insight according to his, um, his wisdom and his insight. And he will lavish us always. And why, uh, like uh, verse 8, it says he lavished. We talked about this last week a little bit. Uh, it's in past tense. That means he already blessed us. Uh, and we can ask this question then, why don't I feel like he gave all the infinite eternal blessings to me already? It seems like that's what he's saying. But whenever Paul talks about, not whenever, often when he talks about in past tense, what he means is he began to give us. He had begun. And then there will be progressively more. And then it will never end. It will be forever. But when we begin to give us, he uses past tense. Like, for example, we are glorified. We are beginning to be glorified, but we are glorified, meaning he already begun. There will be progressive more glorification, progressive more growth, and it will be forever. It will never end. question we can ask then is, why doesn't he give just everything now? Uh, why does he progressively give us more? Why, why does he just begin and... Why doesn't he just give us everything now rather than slowly giving us eternally? That's a legitimate question, isn't it? It's like those movies. There are tens of movies like this. There's Korean movies like this. There's, you know, American movies like this. Usually, uh, let's say a father is like a billionaire or something. And, uh, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't give that inheritance to his son yet. Because he's so immature, he's, so, he's not ready in his character. He did not earn it, he's not going to know how to use it, he's going to squander it. So what the father does is without the son knowing, he sends him to like suffering place, an island or something like that, a rural area that he has to suffer. And then, you know, beside the fact that they, he usually meets a girl, uh, you know, and that they like each other and they fall in, he's a terrible character, but he, they fall in love, not because of money, Right? Then he falls in love and all these things. Then he becomes a better person and they get married or something like that. And then he's ready to receive blessings. Now he grows and he matures. Uh, I think we are like that. You know, we are like spoiled uh, people that are not ready to receive the blessings of God. That's one way to look at it. But another way to look at it is our hearts are so small. Our, our spiritual capacity is so small. So we need to grow. And more we grow, more we receive. What God is doing as we look into the Bible, he lavished upon us means he's always pouring maximum. He's already always pouring so much even now. But whatever the capacity we have, whatever we want, we can receive. And so he has to wait. In fact, he's the one who has to wait. Come on, grow one more desire. More. I want to stuff my grace upon you. That's what he's saying, right? Lavish this grace. But 
as much as we grow, as we, much as we mature, as much as our bowls are cleansed, as much as he takes away, he can fill us uh, with his grace. So, uh, you know, we need to grow <laughs> more. We need to want more. We need to desire more. We need to ask for more because he can give us more than we think, more than we can ask, more than we can imagine. So, uh, that's why progressively now, how much we can handle, how much more, more, it infinitely eternally, he will bless us in Jesus Christ because of Jesus. That's the first point, because of Jesus. Secondly, then let's go to a second point, which is we receive blessings uh, because of Jesus Christ. Verses 9 through 12, these four verses, two verses each, it talks about two main blessings uh, in this passage. First blessing is that we are united under Christ, his lordship. And then second is we receive inheritance because of Christ, his sonship. Let's expand on these two blessings that we receive in Jesus Christ. So first is we are united under Christ, his lordship, verses 9 to 10. Verse 9, it says, making known to us. That means we were ignorant. We didn't know. We didn't know this incredible Blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. We didn't know. We didn't know where to go. We didn't know what to live for. Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose. We were purposeless. We did not know what to live for. But even though we didn't know, everything that have, have happened, had, that is happening, that will happen, is in tune. For history is neither meaningless nor purposeless. It is moving. Everything is moving towards a glorious goal of the glory of God. And that's why the word mystery is used, the mystery of his will. Mystery refers to the revelation of something that was previously hidden or known only vaguely, but now is more fully known. And what is this mystery? Mystery is that this world is in mess. This world is disintegrating. This world is affected by sin, yet everyone is looking for how is this mystery going to be solved? How is, this, how is God going to take care of this problem? And we know that that mystery is going to be solved through Jesus Christ. And uh, Jesus Christ will put everything under Christ, everyone under Christ, which everyone, term, everyone, everyone is expanded in uh, Ephesians as Jews and Gentiles. So everyone, everything will be under Christ, everyone will be under, under Christ, then this mystery will be solved. The problem in this world will be gone. And that's why uh, this verse, verse 10, it says, the plan for the fullness of time, that means at the right time, when the time was, is going to be ripe, time, when the time was ripe, he will unite all things to him. The word he will unite all things to him is a unique, uh, interesting word. That means he will bring everything to unity. And also it can be said he will bring everything unity to sum up. Okay, sum up with something. So the word is used for uh, in Romans chapter 13 verse 9. It says the law, all the laws will be summed up in this sentence as he says you shall love your neighbors as yourself. So everything will be united. Everything will be summed up with something. Everything will be summed up in Jesus Christ. Everything is headed towards that way. What does it mean? It's like, you know, when, when people, somebody try to explain to you a bunch of sentences and you go, what are you saying? And, but when they say one sentence, oh, that's what you're saying. Killer explanation, killer sentence. It's like thesis, if you're a professor, you know these students, they don't know what they're talking about, and it's confusing, and it's, what are you trying to say? You call them, you've got to fix up everything. What are you trying to say? And when they give, what is your thesis sentence? And they give you one thesis sentence. That's what you're talking about. Uh, the Bible is saying that Jesus Christ is a killer thesis statement. Everything will be summed up in Christ, and when you see Jesus, everything will make sense. Everything in history, everything in human history, Mystery of life, mystery of history, mystery of purpose of life. Everything will make sense in Jesus Christ. And that's what he's saying. 
So uh, we are, we'll be united under Christ, under his lordship. And then a uh, second blessing there is that we receive inheritance because of Christ. Uh, it's talking about us emphasizing our sonship. Last couple of verses were talking about his lordship, now our sonship. That's what it means when verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance. What we receive because of Christ, having been predestined according to the purpose of him. So uh, this is, again, the underlying foundation is verse 5 when it says he predestined us for adoption. Whenever we think about predestination, we're th- thinking about God's plan, God's plan of loving us and just lavishing us with his blessings. Inheritance as sons, as children of God. Adoption for himself as sons through Jesus Christ. You have to understand a little bit about the adoption in Roman culture. In Roman law, uh, adopted children enjoy the same rights as natural children. So, that means as adopted children of God, we receive the blessings of Jesus Christ. Exactly the same way. That means blessings of Jesus equals blessings of us as adopted children of God. Now, when, when we say sonship, adopted sons, I know some of you are going, why just sons? Why not sons and daughters? Well, in, those, in that culture, only the sons received inheritance. But what we're saying is, uh, as children of God, uh, uh, as a children of God, both men and women who are in Christ have sonship, are co-heirs of Christ. And that's what the scripture is saying, men and women. Any ethnic group, any gender, anyone who's in Christ, receive the blessings of Jesus Christ in Christ. So verse 12 is saying, and as it says, so that we who were first to hope in Christ, talking about Jews uh, receiving blessings of Christ, and he basically insinuates saying, and he insinuates by saying, uh, you as well, when he says you, he's talking about the Gentiles, both Jews and Gentiles will receive inheritance, the uh, same inheritance in Jesus Christ. First, to, the, to hope in Christ might be to praise of his glory. Now, what is this inheritance? Uh, again, like uh, if you understand the ideas of Paul, Romans 8, 29, as he talks about, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Right? We talked about destiny last week. Predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So his inheritance is not this shallow stuff of money and other things than what we want in our life, but his uh, inheritance is much deeper, much greater which, which is the essence of Jesus, character of Jesus, person of Jesus, into us so that we can become like Jesus Christ. So it's not this shallow things that we desire in this world, but it's the greatest thing, most powerful, most beautiful essence of Christ. We become like Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean we all become the same people. That means we differently become different aspects of Christ so that together we become more and more like Jesus Christ as a church of Jesus Christ. Different gifts, different character, different personality, yet all of us in essence to be like Christ so that we can comprehend him together as a church of Jesus Christ to represent Christ as children of God, as adopted children of God. Uh, a young mother wrote this and said, I stayed with my parents for several days after the birth of our first child. One afternoon, I remarked to my mother that it was surprising that our baby had dark hair since both my husband and I had fair. She said, well, your daddy had black hair. But mama, that doesn't matter because I am adopted. (laughs) Uh, Then the mother said with an embarrassing smile, and said these wonderful words, I always forget. (laughs) Uh, You know, God, of course, in his omniscience, never forgets that we are adopted children of God in Jesus Christ. But in his chesed, loyal, covenant love for us, he forgets. As if he forgets, he just lavishes us. The blessings that he, he would give to his son, one and only son, he gives to us, pouring his blessings upon us, just the same blessings. Uh, it's just that we, we only want this much. We can only re- receive this much uh, in Jesus Christ. 
more, as much as we desire, as much as we can handle. He will pour His grace, lavish His grace upon us. Now let's put this together, two blessings together, right? His Lordship and His Sonship. If you put this together, we'll see this incredible truth how they come together so that His blessing, he, He's blessing us so that we bless other people through the blessings that He gives to us. The word unite, we talked about the word unite. We are, he's uh, uniting us to Christ. The word unite actually is reunite. The word, Greek word, Greek part ana is there. That means reunite. That means one time in history there was unity of, of people to Christ. That was before the fall, before sin came into the world. There was, you know, God put Christ as head above everything and human being to represent Godhead and Christ, and there was unity. But when man sinned, something went wrong. Major part of the system went wrong. You know what system is? Everything works together, but when one major thing goes wrong, everything falls apart. And that's what it happened in this world. Originally, the uni universe was united. Not only human beings, but whole universe, ground, and everything was united. But after sin entered into the world, system broke, and it the whole universe started to disintegrate. Uh, when one thing was out of place, one major thing was out of place, system was not working. When everything was under Christ, uh, you know, uh, the system was working, but when something went off of Christ, whole system started to break down. That means spiritually, mentally, emotionally, universe, whole universe, Death came into the world, disease, relationship broke down, families, marriage started to have problems, system breaks, system breakdown, system failure because of sin entered into the world. And everything started to fall apart. Second th law of thermodynamics, right? Uh, everything is disintegrating. Everything is falling apart. Uh, you know, I, I see Chinese food at the ta on the table all the time, and usually if it's there, I don't know who it's for, but I eat it, you know? Uh, somebody will get mad, but let's say, uh, you know, when I go home and there's Chinese food and let's, it's about three months old. Nah, I'm not going to open that thing. I'm not going to eat it. Help somebody else eat it. No, nobody else eat it. But thing is, when you're there for three months, right, it decays, it rots. Absolutely, right? Everything is like that. Everything is like that, right? If you just leave it alone by itself, Everything will break down. Everything will fall apart. That's the mystery. The whole world is looking at this. Universe is looking at it. Angels are looking at it and go, how is God going to solve this mystery? Uh, God is saying, the mystery is the gospel. Mystery is Jesus Christ. When everything becomes under the lordship of Jesus Christ, the mystery will be solved. And Jesus sums up the universe. He's the killer thesis sentence. Jesus is the true king who shows up so that everything will be defeated and be okay. Uh, everything is made for Christ. When everything worships Christ, everything will be perfectly right. You know, when Jesus uh, is receiving the flogging when, right before he's dying on the cross, and Paul received this too as this flogging, and that's, that's basically like a... 39 lashes. They say 40 minus 1, 39 lashes. And how they did was when they hit it, uh, hit people, there's lead at the end. So when they hit, it, it, it stuck, sticks to people's skin and you pull it. And the skin is pulled. That's why people are almost, uh, people will die. If you hit 40 times, people will die. That's why you call it uh, 40 minus 1, 39 lashes, and Paul went through it three times or something like that. And we see that Jesus Christ being flogged, even before the cross, we know that his skins, uh, his life was pulled apart, pulled flesh. And Jesus Christ was pulled apart so that we can be put together. And through Jesus Christ, when we are all under submission to Christ, Everything will be okay. There is a plan of God. God has a plan that is uh, that uh, through Jesus Christ we will be all under His Lordship. If you have a problem, 
Uh, problem is not you go be a king. No problem. If you have a problem, you need to go find your king. And it will start to resolve. Things will start to resolve in your life. Without him, everyone will fall apart. We know that we are to be, uh, you know, fish ought to live in the water. Right? Same thing. Fish should not be living out of water. Uh, same thing with seed. Seed should be under the ground, not above the ground. When it's above the ground, it's like a Chinese food. It's going to just rot and die, right? But if, it, if the seed is under the ground, it, as it breaks, as it dies, it bears fruit, it will make impact. Uh, and it can fill the tree, fill with trees. It can uh, fill the world. Uh, same thing in our lives. We need to be under the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's the vicinity that we prosper. That's the place where we should be so that we can live for his purpose. We bear fruit. We can make impact in this world. Uh, you need to belong to the ground of the lordship of Jesus Christ in the church of Jesus Christ. That's where you can live a maximum life. That's what you're made for. So, uh, we can live for his kingdom. We need to have kingdom consciousness in our daily life. Every sphere of our lives, we need to expand this kingdom of God as children of God. Kingdom, basically, kingdom of God is multidimensional. Everything in life, in everything in life, Jesus has to be the king. Jesus has to rule. Jesus has to be worshipped. Every sphere of the society, in cultural area, social life, economic area, in everything in this world, uh, you know, uh, we need to have kingdom consciousness in everything we do, that Christ will be supreme. Uh, you know, Jesus Christ, God is our Father, but also Jesus Christ is our Lord. God is not only there to tuck you in, in at night, but also enlist you in the army of Jesus Christ. And when we, uh, we are made to live for this, and when we grow as children of God, God uses us to expand his kingdom. That's how it, it, it put, it's put together. When we receive inheritance of God uh, as children of God, as we grow and more like Jesus Christ, we are the means that he uses in the society and the world to expand his kingdom so that everyone, everything will be under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Uh, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit as a third point, but this weekend, I was, uh, Friday and Saturday, I was in Kansas City. I was speaking there. And, uh, uh, you, you know, this church, this conference is very unique because uh, three years ago they did conference. theme of the conference was on God the Father. Uh, last year was uh, God the Son, Jesus Christ. This year was on the Holy Spirit, and he invited me to speak on the Holy Spirit. So I'm filled with the Holy Spirit right now, you know, at least in my mind. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, it was a wonderful church, many uh, alumni were serving there, and they sent many of their uh, children, many of the students to our uh, church to be members, and many of the church members and surrounding uh, pastors sent uh, youth to our JGen, and every one of those, so when I went, many of the JGen guys came, and uh, they, everyone had some kind of testimony how they were blessed through JGen, and, and, and I was actually speaking to their parents. So I'm old, I guess I'm old. But, uh, and then when we were having lunch, all these church pastors came and they were just thanking me or basically people who are involved in JJ and how their kids are so blessed and changed through JJ and it was a wonderful time. So I was speaking about Holy Spirit. So I can talk a lot about it right now because it's, I'm filled with Holy Spirit, filled with Holy Spirit. But here we go, third point. Thank you for praying. Through the Holy Spirit... Because of Jesus, we receive blessings, sonship and lordship, through the Holy Spirit. Look at this. Uh, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. has three words. In him you also were heard, uh, the word of the truth. When you hear God's word, you are saved. Gospel of your salvation, you are saved. And what happens that when you're saved is that Holy Spirit comes in and you resurrect in your spiritual life so that you can have communication uh, with the Holy Spirit to your spirit. That's what he's saying. It says, and believed in him were sealed, promised, with a promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance. So let's discuss those three words to talk about how Holy Spirit works in our First word is promised. 
What he promises, God promises, he keeps. We can see him promising. We can see he keeps, he's keeping his promise about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, it says, you know, in, at Pentecost, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, and, but wait for the gift my father promised. God promised the empowerment of the Holy Spirit throughout the Old Testament, and the empowerment comes in, at Pentecost. What he keeps, what he says, he keeps. Right? And that promise, what is that fulfillment of the promise? Verse 5, John baptized with water, but in few days will baptize, uh, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So he keeps the promise in the past that assures the promise about the rest. The point is, I know some of you are seeking. We have, I don't know, 30% or something like that, unbelievers, and you're not a Christian in our church. We welcome you. Uh, if you seek him, as you continue to seek him, maybe God is already seeking you through your seeking. If you seek him, God promised that he will come into your heart and you, he will, uh, as he promised, he will give you the Holy Spirit, meaning you'll come alive in your spiritual life and you'll be able to receive all these blessings that we talk about today through the Holy Spirit. Next word is, the word is promised, and next word is sealed. Verse 13, in him you were also sealed with a promised Holy Spirit. Seal could be mark of authenticity or mark of ownership. Paul may be thinking about both. Authenticity means that uh, seal, king had the ring, and when he would write letters with the uh, seal of the ring, he would, you know, he would put, it, put on it, right? He would, uh, he would put the mark of his seal on uh, the letter, then they would know that, that that's the authentic letter from the king. So to check the authenticity of Christian, whether, do I know, am I, am I really a Christian or not? We know that there, if there's a working of the Holy Spirit, sealing of the Holy Spirit, you can see the sign of the Holy Spirit's presence in your heart, you know you're a believer. But I, I believe a stronger sense than that is that seal means ownership, that he, we are sealed in the Holy Spirit. During that time in the first century, cattle, even, sometimes even slaves, were branded with a seal by their master in order to indicate that, hey, these uh, cattle belong to me. Talking about an ownership. So God is saying, when you have the Holy Spirit, it's like a seal in your heart. Those seals were external, but God's seal is in our hearts. So when we see the working of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, we know that God is saying, you are mine. <laughs> you are mine now and forevermore. Sometimes it's hard to tell whether there's a working of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, but uh, we can talk about it in multiple ways. If there's, of course, spiritual desire. Right? There's, we have sinful desires. So do we have spiritual desire to love God and worship God? Did it ever uh, start to happen in your life? That's a way to check. And one of the ways to check is I know people, some people who fail, they doubt about the presence of God, presence of Christ, the presence of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. But I would say this, when you fail, Often you can know whether there's working of the Holy Spirit. When you fail, do you go, okay, I failed, so I quit. I'm just going to, there was an incredible pleasure in my sin. So I'm just going to go do whatever I want, however I, I, live in, I want to live in my life. Is that what you do? Most of you probably not because you're here <laughs> after you fail. Probably after you fail, you're going, oh, my God. Goodness, why did I do that? Like what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 7. Why did I do that? Ah! Maybe you are discouraged. Even the fact that you're discouraged. There's something else that you wanted, but you did not, uh, you failed. Uh, there was, you know, you had spiritual desire. So whenever you have contrary, any contrary desire, after you sin, you feel guilty. You feel even self-condemnation sometimes. Um, but not staying there, even guilt. Those are probably, those might be, even though they're sinful desire, that's why you sin, there might be spiritual desire, Holy Spirit working, and Holy Spirit there is jealous because when you live for yourself, you are exalting yourself. But when the Holy Spirit is working, Holy Spirit is working, He's jealous that Jesus Christ is not exalting your heart. So Holy Spirit works in your heart, sometimes to give you guilt, sometimes to make you feel miserable so that your experience of pleasure be replaced by your misery 
so that you cannot help but to the, go to the cross. So you can go to him again and again and again. And, uh, you know, that is, may not be, you know, that may not be. Some of you, when you sin, you go, oh, maybe I'm not a Christian. Maybe after you sin and you know there's another desire rising, not so that you will not fall away from sin, is probably jealousy of the Holy Spirit, working of the Holy Spirit. So Christian is not someone who does not sin. Christian is someone who repents his sin, fights his sin, who feels guilty, who wants to hate sin, and still love for the sin is there, but wants to hate sin. So who goes to Christ again and again and again? And when you go again and again, can you look at me? Some people think when we go to him again and again, our Christian life is like that, again and again and again. But we, even myself, we go up and down like this, but... It's not like this. It goes like this. Again and again and again. That's Christian life. We're going to grow through the process. Keep on going to the Lord. When you fail. When you fail, keep on going to him. Keep on fighting. He's going to help you. He's going to strengthen you. But you're going to grow through that process so that you can glow through his presence. Keep on going to the Lord. Maybe that's the way God is saying to you, You're mine! <laughs> I'm in you. My spirit is in you. You're mine. You can never get away from me. I know you want to. You sin. But you can never get, a, get away from me. I will never let you go. Nothing can separate you from my love. So go to him. Promise, seal, guarantee. Verse 14. I love this word. Who is the guarantee? What does guarantee mean? Guarantee means basically first installment. First installment. What is first installment? That means I'm giving you this as first installment, but the rest is coming. That's what he's saying. So Holy Spirit is in us, and he's saying when you experience that, that's just nothing compared to how much I'll give you. And the reason why he doesn't give fullness of that, of course, is because we cannot handle it, because we want something else, because we have sin nature in us. But whenever we experience it, it's like an allowance. <laughs> it's like a taste, morsel. It's like an appetizer. Main meal is coming. Keep on wanting it. He makes us taste it so that we will want more. First installment means deposit, down payment, pledge that pays part of the purchase price in advance. But guarantee the rest is on the way. He's helping us taste a little bit of blessing through the Holy Spirit. But eternal, infinite Greater blessings is coming. Even though we go up and down, we're going to grow through that process until we are, we'll glow in Jesus Christ. It's similar to like engagement ring or marriage ring. Right? Engagement ring is, I don't know why in America, like you know you're going to get married to that person, you still surprise the other person. And then you have to act surprised, right, ladies? Like you knew it was coming and you kind of insinuated, you kind of pressured him and, and oh, <laughs> you receive that. So, it's okay. I'm not criticizing all that. It's not unbiblical. But when you give that ring, basically what are you saying? You're saying, this is the sign of my love. But this is nothing compared to how much I'm going to love you the rest of your life. Engagement ring is, I'm just showing you the sign of my love, a little bit of my love. But I'm going to basically, I'm going to commit to you. I'm going to love you more. I'm going to love you more and more. It's just the first installment. The rest is coming uh, throughout our life. And that's what God is saying to us. He's in love with us. And whatever we experience is just an appetizer. First installment. Uh, foretaste of. Just a pledge. And he's going to fill us with his love. Infinitely eternally in Jesus Christ. More coming, more grace, more love, more growth, more glory. That's what we're headed to in Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus, we receive blessings through the Holy Spirit. Let's pray.